The U.S. and China are two of the world's biggest cotton producers. The U.S. exports most of its cotton, and its biggest customer is China, which bought nearly $3 billion of American cotton last year. At the same time, China exports the largest share of its finished textiles to the U.S. But the balance of that relationship is shifting. In 2021, President Joe Biden signed a law banning imports from China's main cotton-growing region, Xinjiang, home of millions of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. Human rights groups have accused China of detaining as many as one million people and forcing them into labor, which China has repeatedly denied. The impact of banning this cotton uh, in China can't be overstated. U.S. cotton prices surged after many American companies scrambled for new cotton sources. China even started importing more American cotton, since lots of its domestic supply couldn't be used for goods sent to the U.S. But now, those imports have been declining. This comes at a time when U.S. cotton farmers were already struggling due to lower prices and drought. And because China is so enmeshed in the cotton supply chain, plenty of Xinjiang cotton is still making it into the U.S., according to companies that do forensic testing of cotton apparel. Here's how the U.S. effort to stamp out forced labor has impacted the cotton market in both countries. The U.S. grows about 12% of the world's cotton. China grows more than double that, about 26%. And China isn't just the world's biggest grower of cotton, it's a key processor of it too. The garment processing, textile processing industry really isn't based that much in the United States anymore. So it goes overseas. Uh, China is a big uh, destination, but then you also have uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Sri Lanka. According to estimates from December 2022, China milled about 35.5 million bales of cotton last year. The U.S. milled about 2.3 million bales. China has remained a key player in the cotton supply chain, but its role has been shifting. More and more, other countries like Vietnam, Pakistan, and Bangladesh have been importing raw cotton, milling it into yarn, and then sending the yarn to China. It is kind of tough to know, um, you know, where exactly your cotton is coming from. I think the way that a lot of these facilities work, it's really tough to audit whether or not, you know, a Chinese mill, for example, is using cotton that comes from Xinjiang or from elsewhere in the world. As cotton gets cleaned, purified, and finished via a complicated supply chain, it becomes harder and harder to know where the original cotton came from, which makes it easier for companies to dodge import restrictions. Then there's the final stage of the process using yarn or fabric to make the finished goods. China also leads here. U.S. trade statistics suggest U.S. imports of cotton products from China have decreased over the last decade, though the country is still the biggest source of U.S. cotton textiles and apparel. The U.S., meanwhile, makes few of its own finished goods. One trade group found less than 3% of apparel sold in the U.S. last year was produced domestically, though those figures weren't specific to cotton. We live in a hyper-globally competitive marketplace. You've seen a decimation of critical aspects of our industry. Kim Glass is the president and CEO of the National Council of Textile Organizations, which represents domestic manufacturers. She says goods made by forced labor in China make it impossible for American businesses to compete. In the cotton supply chain, it, it's pennies that moves and shifts production globally from one country to another. And particularly on the areas of Xinjiang and forced labor associated with those cotton supply chains, that has had a severe economic impact on the U.S. domestic textile industry. Importers have to document the products they're bringing into the U.S., but this doesn't always tell the whole story. U.S. Customs and Border Protection detains some goods that its risk assessment tools flag as potentially illegal and importers are required to present additional documentation to get them released. But some, like Glass, say enforcement of the ban has been insufficient. The numbers are completely underwhelming on enforcement activities. A few dozen shipments stopped per month. We're talking about thousands and millions of packages coming in that contain apparel items. We should be seeing stop shipments off the port of LA every day. The clearest way to know where an item comes from is to test its chemical components and DNA. Customs tests some imports, but many companies also do their own to validate their supply chains. Cotton is a plant and it has to, just like you and I, take in nutrients so you can analyze those nutrients to get an idea of where the plant was grown. Applied DNA Sciences is a biotech company based on Long Island. 
It specializes in supply chain tracing, as well as genetic testing and therapeutics. We have two different colors of the same shirt submitted by the same client. Um, both claim to be from Brazil. Um, one of them tested clearly as being from Brazil and it matched with our library Brazilian samples, while the other one matched with Xinjiang. And there would be no way on a rack to tell. Um, they would be right next to each other, a black and a white shirt. They also do DNA tagging, spraying a molecular tag onto raw fibers at the cotton gin, so companies can track their raw cotton through the supply chain. About 14 or 15 percent of the finished goods we test show evidence of Xinjiang cotton. We tell the people who've asked us to test that product, and then they have to push harder on their supply chain. Given the complexity of ensuring goods from China don't contain Xinjiang cotton, retailers like L.L. Bean and Mango have cut out China completely. You see brands moving their operations to get around uh, China in general because they don't want to run into a situation where they can't sell in the U.S. You see them moving, these companies moving their supply chains out of China to places like Vietnam or uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, you know, all the names that you see when you look at the back of your shirt. But this is missing a major part of the story. According to experts, many of these goods may have been processed or even made in China, but are being exported to the U.S. via another country. Another thing trade data misses is a loophole that many industry experts say allows China to ship goods containing banned cotton into the U.S. A huge number of shipments from China arrive through a rule called de minimis which allows shipments worth under $800 to come into the U.S. without incurring tariffs or requiring as much paperwork. This is significantly higher than the de minimis limit for imports to China, which is just 50 yuan, less than $7. Some lawmakers are trying to modify this rule to keep banned Chinese cotton out and level the playing field for U.S. cotton growers, who have already been dealing with decreasing prices and drought. The Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act is ultimately designed to clamp down on forced labor, but it also has major bearings on the U.S. cotton industry. Theoretically, when the ban first came into place, U.S. cotton growers were really hoping that that would uh, give uh, cotton prices in general a boost, would give export demand a boost, which it has to some extent. But ultimately, it hasn't been enough, at least so far, to offset the long-term decline of the U.S. cotton industry.